Xerxes was born to Darius I and Atosa, daughter of Cyrus the Great. While King Darius I was preparing for a war against Greece, a tax regulation spurred in Egypt in 486 BC, and according to Persian law, it was custom that King Darius selected a successor should he not return from such an expedition. He had chosen his eldest son, Xerxes I, who became ruler of Persia shortly after his father passed due to failing health issues. Xerxes I was notably known in Western history in leading the Persian Empire for his invasion against Greece in 480 BC. Like his predecessor, Darius, he ruled the Achaemenid Empire, also known as the First Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus the Great. At its territorial apex, managing to conquer more of the mainland of Greece through the battles at Thermopylae and Artemisia. Xerxes was known to wear jewelry and makeup outside the norm of a man, mostly because of the religion that was practiced under the Achaemenid Empire, which was Zoroastrianism. It combines cosmogonic dualism and eschatological monotheism, which was the official religion of Persia around 600 BC to 650 AD, founded by the prophet Zoroaster. It also was the official religion amongst the Iranian peoples until Islam superseded the religion in the 7th century, according to the Muslim denominations, the Sunni and the Shia, who believe the angel Gabriel provided the true word of God to the prophet Muhammad in Arabia. The angel Gabriel made several visitations to Muhammad, which took place about 610 AD, almost 700 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, around 30 to 36 AD. Now was Muhammad crazy, and did he really receive visitations from the angel Gabriel? No, he was not crazy, and yes, he did receive inspiration. However, it wasn't the inspiration from the angel Gabriel of the Bible. If we look in the book of Galatians, which was written about 49 AD, at the most 13 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, and about 561 years before the Muslim faith, Galatians 1 verse 8 through 9 reads, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. What the Apostle Paul is implying with urgency is that any other faith that deters you from the gospel of Christ is going to lead to their own demise. Verse 8 states, not just men can deter you, but angels from heaven as well. Genesis 1 verse 1 states, God created time, space, and matter simultaneously, creating the heavens, plural, and the earth. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 through 15 states that Satan, our enemy, and his ministers, who are angels, can transform themselves into an angel of light. As I stated in the explanation of Lucifer's origin, our enemy's domain is the atmosphere of earth and all of the vacuum of space. Muhammad's angelic experience was not from the angel Gabriel of third heaven or paradise where God is and who speaks on behalf of God, but it was an angel of our enemy from the first and second heavens who had spoken against the word of God to solely start a doctrine by way of deception which we now have over 1 billion followers as the Muslim faith being the second largest religion in the world. One of the angels within our enemy's domain came to Muhammad and deceived him into thinking the angel was an angel of light or an angel of God. And so we can apply this explanation to all forms of doctrine that do not line up with the canon of scripture. Xerxes comes from an empire that was heavily induced in practices outside of the ways of the Israelites. The great writer, producer, and director, Frank Miller, gives us a visual of Xerxes' campaign 
to overthrow Greece at the Battle of Thermopylae in the graphic novel 300. During August of 480 BC, King Leonidas and 300 of his Spartan troops, along with about 7,000 other Greek forces, held over a quarter of a million troops led by Xerxes over the course of three days. A second invasion occurred simultaneously during the Battle of Artemisium. The novel begins with one of Xerxes' Persian messengers offering the culture of Greece to be spared from Xerxes' dominion if only King Leonidas would be the first of Greece to surrender and worship Xerxes as their god. Leonidas and his troops killed the messenger and later consults with the scribes of Sparta, sharing his plans for the upcoming battle against Persia. However, the scribes could not give Leonidas their blessing until they've consulted with the adolescent's oracle. The scribes knew that the oracle would not condone the fight against Persia, as they were all secretly bought by Xerxes to work in his favor. Leonidas and 300 Spartans defy the words of the oracle and marched to the coastal pass of Thermopylae, also known as the Hot Gates, to defend the main entrance. Xerxes' first wave of troops arrived and were shipwrecked by the massive storm reducing the number of Persians for battle. Due to the fighting techniques of Sparta, Leonidas and his soldiers had very little casualties on the first day of battle, including the first night fighting a myriad of various armies under the rule of Xerxes. An even larger wave of soldiers attempted to defeat Leonidas from stampedes to mystical forces, none of which were effective against the Spartans. Xerxes attempts to send another messenger to bring about reason, which doesn't go very well as the messenger threatens the soldiers, leading to the messenger returning to Xerxes with an amputated arm. Finally. Xerxes shows up himself to make a deal with Leonidas to surrender, knowing that if Sparta surrenders, then all of Greece would simply follow suit. Xerxes' offer is rejected with him stating, the very existence of Leonidas and all history of Sparta will be eradicated, and Leonidas calmly replies that everyone will know that a man who fancies himself a god-king can bleed. By the third day, a local resident named Ephialtes betrayed the Greeks by revealing that a small path led behind the Greek lines. Leonidas was aware that his force was being outflanked, so he dismissed the bulk of the Greek army and remained with a handful of soldiers to guard their retreat. He also has one of his troops to deliver a message before the Spartan council to tell what happened and to rally the entire Spartan army to finish what he started. So by the third day, Leonidas and his troops are surrounded with one final chance to surrender offered by Xerxes. Leonidas creates the illusion of a surrender, but then surprises the surrounding Persian forces with one final act of resistance, ordering his men to attack. Leonidas honors his word mentioned earlier to Xerxes that even a god king can bleed by throwing a spear that tears his lip piercings in an attempt to show all that fear him can see he is just a man. Leonidas and his 300 Spartans are all killed, ending with the full invasion of the entire fleet of Sparta. Xerxes I overran Thermopylae and eventually took control of Boeotia. When the Greek Athenian politician Themistocles heard of the defeat at Thermopylae, he withdrew the Greek navy from the simultaneous battle of Artemisium to invade the Battle of Salus, late 480 BC. Xerxes I withdrew his armies, fearing of being trapped in Europe, with much of his army in Asia, who died of starvation and disease. A year later, the Greek army defeated the Battle of Plataea, causing Xerxes I to abandon his campaign. In August of 465 BC, Xerxes was assassinated by Artabanus, the most powerful official of the Persian court. Xerxes I had three sons, of which his eldest, Darius II, was also killed by Artabanus. Xerxes' true successor would be his third son, Artaxerxes, who kills Artabanus and all of his descendants for the murder of his father and brother. 
We read about Artaxerxes in the book of Ezra, chapter 4 through chapter 6, where he receives letters of accusations from the adversaries who were brought to Israel by Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, that the descendants of the Jews were preparing to rebuild their temple after the 70-year Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. The majority of the Council of Israel began rebuilding because of a decree established by Cyrus the Great giving them the authority. The adversaries beseeched Artaxerxes that if they build this temple, then the Israelites will not pay taxes or tribute and the king's treasury would be diminished and so they demanded a search for this decree from the archives. The construction process of the temple was on hold until a deposition was given from the king of Persia, which the temple was discontinued until the reign of Darius III, son of Artaxerxes. After some time had passed, still waiting on the deposition, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, along with the other council of Israel, began building on the temple, for God was with them. This led to a second search, this time made by the king Darius III, which indeed he found and carried out the decree given by Cyrus the Great within the first year of his reign. Now why Cyrus wrote the decree comes from an amazing prophecy in the Bible by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 45 verse 1 through 6 that God called Cyrus to free the Jews despite Cyrus not acknowledging God at all but invincing his sovereignty over all nations. This prophecy was given before Cyrus was even born with the book of Isaiah written between 701 BC and 681 BC and Cyrus's decree was established approximately 536 BC, about 155 years after the book of Isaiah was written. Isaiah 45, verse 1 through 6 reads, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect. I have even called you by your name. I have named you though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The prophet Daniel was not only under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, but also served under the rule of Cyrus by way of usurping the Babylonian Empire until at least the third year of his reign, and most likely had some involvement with Cyrus issuing the decree by informing him of the biblical prophecies. Although King Xerxes I, who led the Battle of Thermopylae, is not referenced in the Bible, but he is the direct descendant from his grandfather Cyrus the Great, who decreed a legal document for the reconstruction of God's temple. And he is the grandfather of Darius III, son of Artaxerxes, who carried out that decree, which resulted in God receiving the glory.